Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Lovely, lovely to be back. Do come in. Just about to start, so do come in and find your space and make yourself comfortable. Well, yes, a very, very warm welcome to you all, whether you're present. It's nice to be actually physically in the same place again, isn't it? Who'd have thought sort of 12, 30 months ago we'd have been so pleased to be spaced out two metres apart, wearing masks and all facing the same direction? That's a privilege now, isn't it? It's good. It's good. Uh, welcome to all of those of you who are watching at home on YouTube. Uh, you're very much part of our service. Please do uh, participate on the live chat. I'm afraid I won't respond because my eyesight isn't good enough to see it on the screen that I've got here. But people at the back who are more technically proficient than I will endeavour to, to register that. Uh, I've got a particular question for you, Peter Gallagher, if you're watching. So uh, please uh, answer that if, when you get to the, the relevant part. And to those of you who are listening uh, by telephone using Zoom, if, if you are, uh, then you too are very much welcome. And I will try my best to describe what people present are seeing. But let's start, most importantly, by inviting God to be present with us and to reveal himself to us. Father God, we do indeed ask you to reveal yourself to us uh, and to reveal your love to us this morning. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you will open our eyes and our ears so that we might each individually see and hear what you want us to know. We ask that in your grace and mercy you'd soften our hard hearts so that we might understand and that we might experience the voice of Jesus for ourselves this morning. We ask this in his precious name. Now this morning we're going to be looking at uh, the parable of the sower and the seeds, and our entitled uh, is uh, Sow and Grow, so it's a very horticultural theme, a gardening theme running through this morning's uh, service. Now when I was young I did love plants from a very early age, I liked to have a pot plant in my room, but I wasn't very good at the actual caring part, the actual gardening part. I liked the way they looked and the rest of it, um, but I found the caring for them just too boring and slow. I don't know whether any children recognise that. You know, go into a garden, do something, and three months later, a bit of colour might appear. I, I find that too boring uh, and slow. And talking of, of slow and boring, here's our slide with um, Alan showing us the rules that we have to remind ourselves about. Um, please do take a moment to refresh yourself. I know you think you know this. It's the, like the bit at the beginning when you go on a plane journey. Remember plane journeys we used to do? A uh, plane journey where they say, I know you know what the routine is, but it's really important you listen and watch. Well, it's really important you just take, refresh yourselves for those presents of the rules uh, whilst we're here. Now, we have asked God to be uh, present, to reveal himself uh, to us, but we also need to do our part don't we, by focusing on him and listening to him. We're going to play a song now for you to listen to. Uh, the song is called Lift Up My Eyes, and it reflects that very need for us to lift our eyes from the troubles, the circumstances, the difficulties that are around us, uh, however important they are, however pressing they are, and to lift our eyes upwards uh, to God. It's a song by, a, by a, a very young worship group called Rivers and Robots. If you want to know why they're called that, I'll tell you later. Um, but let's thank God that they're using the musical talents and abilities that they've got to praise, worship, uh, and honour God. I particularly like this group uh, because they put a lot of care into having biblically accurate words and concepts as well as producing lovely music. Now, Revelation 5 declares that Jesus' blood has purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language, people, and nation. And one of the things I have really enjoyed in lockdown is when we've used internet resources, they've obviously come from all around the world, and seeing the huge variety of people within God's family. And this video uh, was actually made by uh, people who enjoy uh, Rivers and Robots music, um, just uh, holding up parts of the words from uh, the song and expressing the joy and the peace 
that comes from being in relationship with the creator God, the king of all creation, who brings salvation, who brings true and deepest satisfaction of our deepest needs, who in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, is our rock, our fortress. Even whether we feel weak, whether we feel like we're in a period of darkness, he is there and he is our solid ground. So listen and watch, see what you think. Uh, But above all, take this time to put aside the other things going on in your heads and to focus on our Heavenly Father.
I really enjoy seeing normal people from around the world worshipping uh, God. So I'm pleased for that. Uh, can I just make a, a point to the children? Please don't ever sit on a railway line uh, with, a, with a piece of paper. That's not a good idea. I'm suspecting that's a disused railway line. Never, ever replicate that, please. Uh, so we're going to move on, our gardening theme, to Bethany's uh, gardener's question time. Peter Gallagher, I want you on standby on live chat if you're there for this. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions, some basic questions about gardening. And if you get most of these right, then you can officially declare yourself as having uh, a green thumb. Okay, so I've got some questions for us, and I'll try and... Um, I'll try and describe these through uh, for those who are listening. So the question is, what do plants need to grow? Uh, and working clockwise on the top left, we've got some watering going on. Um, in the middle at the top, we've got the sound of music, quite literally. Um, on, the, on the top right, we've got uh, some soil. Um, bottom right, we've got gadgets. Uh, Middle bottom, we've got uh, sunshine, and bottom left, we've got some sweets. So let's just do a, a raise of hands for which of the which uh, do plants need to grow? Water. Hands up who thinks what plants need water to grow. Okay, good. Uh, who thinks they need the sound of music? Is Prince Charles in the room? Is it? <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a token gesture from a controversial daughter of mine. Who thinks they need soil? Yeah, okay. Who thinks they need uh, sweets? Nell's very firm that they do. Uh, who thinks they need sunshine? And lastly, who thinks they need some gadgets, latest gadgets? No, that's a, that's a complete no. Okay, hope you did well on that at home, uh, on YouTube or on Zoom. Uh, ne our next question. Um, what do plants feed on? So working clockwise from the top again, we've got a hot dog with a lovely zigzag of mustard there. Um, we've got uh, a curry... You're right, Alan, it is a Himalayan venison curry. Um, then we've got a lovely, huge ham salad sandwich. Then we've got a collection of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, and then last of all, we've got spaghetti bolognese. So this is not what you would like. It's what do plants feed on. So hands up if you think plants feed on hot dogs. Samuel, well done. Uh, next, uh, a Himalayan venison uh, curry. No, none for that. Uh, a very large and fresh-looking ham salad sandwich, anybody? No. Uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Anyone go for that? Yeah, that's a popular one. Wouldn't, not, wouldn't be my choice, but... And spaghetti bolognese. Anybody going for that? Well done, Jacob. So serious questions about the culinary choices made in the Leslie household. Uh, okay, next. Um, Simple question, this is just a yes, no. Who thinks weeds are good or bad for plants around them? So uh, who thinks they're good for weeds? Hands up if you think weeds are good for plants. Hands up if you think weeds are bad for plants. Jacob is a very controversial character. Well done. And on our next slide, what we've got, the, the question is... Um, are these activities good or bad for plants? And again, working clock lives, what we've got is a, is a pet playing in and on the plants. Then we've got somebody stomping all over the, over the plants. I can imagine several people in this room would do that sort of thing, Alan Garner. Um, then we've got somebody watering plants. And then, oh, oh very good. And then uh, we've got somebody setting fire to plants. It's not very good. Uh, and then we've got somebody weeding plants. So uh, on the on the. I haven't asked you yet. I get, I get you've got it. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you the question. So, uh, the pets playing on and in plants, um, is that good for them or bad? Who thinks it's good for them? Nobody. Who thinks stomping on plants with great big boots is good for, good for them? Nobody. Who thinks watering them is good for... Yeah, we've got good gardeners in this, in this church. Uh, setting fire to them. I think that's a bit of police activity there, if you're interested. Uh, no, nobody's gone for that. Uh, and weeding around them. Who thinks that's good for plant? Yeah, okay, excellent. Uh, next, uh, which of these are pests to garden plants? So for those who are listening, what we've got top left is we've got a great big brown slimy slug. Uh, next to that, we've got a ground beetle. Uh, next to that again, we've got a sort of a clump of black, black fly aphids. Uh, and then below that, we've got a box caterpillar, pretty little thing that it is. Um, and then we've got an earwig. Never really understood why an earwig's called an earwig. It doesn't go in your ear, it doesn't wear a wig. What's that? 
Anyway, um, getting off subject. Uh, and then lastly, a red lily beetle. So who thinks that a slug is a pest in the, in the garden? Yes. Well done, Nicole. Nicole first up there. She's very clear on that. I think there might have been a traumatic experience, perhaps when she was uh, evading the, the food that her mum was cooking. I don't know. Um, next, who thinks a ground beetle <coughs> is a pest? Okay, there's a couple there. Oh, 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 slow risers, not, not, not sure. Um, who thinks the black fly are a pest in the garden? Oh, yes. Agree with you. Yeah. Uh, who thinks the box caterpillar is a pest? Not many, but yeah, a few went up fast, though. Uh, an earwig. A poorly named earwig, yeah. Uh, and lastly, the red lily beetle. It is pretty, though, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, just so you know, because um, I think the rest are all fairly obvious, the ground beetle actually is, is quite positive in the garden because it eats the slugs that are next to it. So it's quite good. Otherwise, all the rest, even the caterpillar, which looks beautiful, is actually quite destructive in the garden. So sometimes things that look nice can be quite destructive. Lastly, I wanted to look at uh, which of these types of clothing are suitable for gardening. So again, for those who are uh, listening, what we've got is uh, wedding outfits on the, on the work, this is working from left to right. Wedding outfits, they look very pretty, don't they? Uh, then a Victorian men's, uh, or man's, there's only one of them in there, man's swimming costume, that's from my holiday this year. Um, and then we've got some very um, hard wearing uh, set of uh, trousers, shirt, glove and hats, uh, very, very protective. And then f furthest of all, we've got a firefighter's outfit. So, Let's look, start first of all, which of these clothes are suitable for gardening? We've got, I mean, they are the best dressed gardeners, aren't they? The ones in the suit and the dress. And they look, they look pretty. Uh, who thinks they're suitable for gardening? No, nobody? No? Okay, well, maybe, maybe you're right. They look, a, they look a little bit restrictive, don't they? The bow tie and the tight waist on the dress, a bit restrictive. So how, how about the, uh, the swimming costume then? That's, that's got a lot more give in it, hasn't it? Well, you know, Alan. It's got a lot more giving it. That's good. No? Nobody interested in gardening in, in that? Okay. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Not much protection there, is there? If you're in amongst the thorns, the weeds, there's, there's different biting insects. Not much protection. So what about the third item, the, the very sensible, hard-wearing, short uh, trousers, shirt, hat and, hat and gloves? They're protective. Yeah, that's what Nicole's wearing when she's going after that slug. Yeah, that's, that's what most people are wearing. Well, what about the furthest Right, I mean, that's even more protective, isn't it? That's, that's not just protecting you from rose thorns and insects. Um, basically, you could take on an ogre with that axe he's got. Uh, you'd be resistant to fire for quite a long time. So that might, must be better, better still, mustn't it? Anybody going for the firefight? Well done, Jacob. You wouldn't let me down. Well done. Somebody have a word with Jackie afterwards about her desire for dressing up as a fireman in the garden. Okay. Lovely. Well, well done, all of you. So I'm really impressed. I think you've all pretty much got a green thumb there. You know how to, how to take care of things in the garden. Now, what I want to um, draw to your attention and get you to think about is seeds are often used as metaphors. Have you ever heard people using the idea of a seed as a metaphor? So people talk about like the seed of an idea, don't they? Um, some in business people call it sort of seed incubators where new businesses that just started are growing um, and people also use the idea of seeds for uh, the idea of a relationship which is taking root and that they hope will blossom now I'm going to play for you now a song just for a little while ago 1908 um, it's not a Christian song let me make that clear to start with but I use it simply for illustrative purposes and children, I want you to listen to this and, li and think, this is genuinely what music used to sound like and people used to want to listen to, okay? So this is a song by somebody called Stanley Holloway. I'll let you listen. <laughs> Busy little honeybees were buzzing to and fro, humming in the summer air. Gathering the honey and the little drops of dew That lay within the blossoms fair A youth and a maid through a garden strayed And the youth seemed out of sorts So the maid with a smile just to tease him said I'll give a penny for your thoughts 
I was wondering, said he, if I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, would it grow to be a great big love someday? Or would it die and fade away? Would you care for it and attend it every day till the time when all must part? If I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, if I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, would it grow to be a great big love someday, or would it die and fade away? Would you care for it and attend? Every day till the time when all must part. If I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, if I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart. Well, there we are. That was Cutting Edge back 1908 or not onwards, although I think it actually became quite famous in the sort of 40s, 50s as well. Uh, there's a prize to anybody who can tell me what Stanley Holloway was famous for, not now, later, and the prize is that I'll tell you how I know the song. Now, children, the reason why we played that was because it talks about planting a tiny seed, um, and that's what we're looking at today. That's the purpose of our, uh, of our service this morning. That's the parable we're looking at. On your table, with great risk, I have put cups of seeds... At similarly great risk, I've put glue. With much less risk, I've put a piece of black paper. That is therefore, if you've undertaken the other activities or you just want to, I'm going to invite you to try and make the best picture out of seeds you can. So you pick something from within our service this morning and you use the glue and the seeds to uh, make a picture. That's the idea of it, okay? Uh, and there's bonus points for anybody who can cover their, one of their parents in seeds to the extent that... Pigeons come and carry them off after the service. Okay. So people use the idea of seeds to convey messages, and that's what Jesus was doing when he taught this parable that we're looking at. And when Jesus teaches us something, we need to stop and listen. So we're going to read the passage now. And it's found, it's found in all three uh, Gospels, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, we're going to read Matthew's version. So this is it from Matthew 13, uh, verses 3 to 9, first of all. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now the good news for those of us who struggle to understand these things quickly is that the disciples also struggled to understand. So they had a conversation with him in the middle of this where they said, oh, why do you always teach in parables? And Jesus explained it, and that's, that's for another day. But he then went on to explain this parable to them. So very helpfully, we have Jesus himself telling us, look, this is what this means. And we find that in verses 18 to 23. So let's read those. This is Jesus' explanation. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But when the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it, this is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So let's now see that portrayed for us by our friends at Saddleback Kids. Stories of the Bible. The parable of the farmer. This is Jesus. hey Who is the son of God and the savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. One day, Jesus went and sat beside the sea. A great crowd gathered around him. Oh, hey, everyone. So he got in a boat and told them many things in parables. Okay, listen to this. He told them this story. A farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil among rocks. The seed began to grow quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When Jesus had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Yeah? Later, the disciples came to Jesus and asked what this parable meant. Jesus said, The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are treated badly for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the desire for other things. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. So there we have the idea of the soil representing our hearts. That's what the, that's what the parable is showing, and the different types of reaction, the different types of hearts people have in response to the word of God. Now, I'm showing on the screen a picture of a path. It's a sort of path which is just earth, but it's been trodden down so that it's really hard. It looks sort of a bit like concrete, really. Um, and I think we've probably all walked on paths like that, maybe at first or some other light, where just the number of people walking on it has squashed everything down so that the earth is really hard. 
So we have this picture in the parable, this part of the parable, of really hard, compacted soil on the path. And the consequence of it being really hard is that seed doesn't go into the earth. It doesn't go into the place where it should go and do its work. And because it's just left there, it's snatched away by the evil one who Jesus explains is Satan. So we have this picture of people who are hard-hearted. And that picture of being hard-hearted is a frequent picture in the Bible. In Exodus 7, 8, 9, we have that interaction between Moses and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is described as being hard-hearted. And that's because he's resisting God's direction resisting God's call in in Zechariah 7 it says this about people denying God's call they made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets so again we have this idea that being hard-hearted is being resistant to God not listening to him and we have warnings in in Proverbs 28 about not being hard-hearted And in Psalm 95 and Hebrews 3, we also have reminders to to God's people not to be hard-hearted like they were at Meribah and Massah. So this principle of not being hard-hearted, but people do become hard-hearted to God for many reasons. Sometimes it's a big one-off event in their life. Sometimes it's just the sheer wear and tear. Sometimes they feel let down by people who profess Christ. They think that's a bad example. It's a warning to us all. But whatever it is, they become hard-hearted to God. They become hard-hearted to the good news of Jesus Christ. So the, the seed of God's word, his word of love and hope, doesn't go in. Tragically, the, the answer to people's deepest needs and the means of true peace and salvation, restored relationship with him, is unrecognised, and unreceived and then it's snatched away by the evil one now we need God's support every single day to be vigilant against uh, Satan's attempts to harm our relationship with God that's what he wants to do we need to be alert to him we need to avoid giving him any foothold in our life and we need to resist his lies the temptations he puts in front of us and his influence We're going to listen to a song now, which is a daily prayer. That's the title of the song, which includes that plea to God to help us to resist the evil one, the tempter. So let's listen to this next song. Thank you. 
part of our daily prayer as well. Now next on the screen we're addressing the next type of soil, the next type of heart that people can have and it's the rocky soil. And on the screen we've got a picture of a, well it's probably taken from a cliff edge where it says a large amount of rock and then a thin layer of soil and vegetation on the top. And that's the picture that Jesus presents and actually that was very common of the ground in and around Palestine at that time certainly. So what we see Um, described is that there is a little bit of soil but it's just a shallow thin layer and so the seed can go in it's initially received by the soil but there's not much space for it to grow the roots don't grow properly so they're insufficient and it can't survive the difficulties of life the pressure that comes on that plant Jesus explains how that's like faith where the roots aren't deep And when that faith is put under pressure, it's tested, it falls down, it withers. So the question that leaves with us is how how deep do our roots go? Are we actually trying to encourage our roots to go deeper? And it's a shame, isn't it? Because a lot of people do hear God's word, welcome it, and initially accept it. They make some sort of commitment. I'm sure we can all think of people who've done that over the years. But sadly, they never really deepen that relationship with God. They never really strengthen their faith so that when the hard times come, and they do come for every single one of us, many of us will be going through hard times. Now, when that happens, that shallow, weak faith doesn't survive and they give up. The next type of soil is the thorny soil. And there we've got a picture of, well, it looks like some sort of briar patch with all sorts of tangles and thorns and weeds across it. And you'd struggle to grow anything in there, I think. So Jesus describes this thorny soil <clears throat> as again being soil in which the seed initially is received and grows. <clears throat> but he describes this life as being crowded. There's lots of competition there. He talks about the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, maybe that pursuit of a good life, a happy life, a safe life. And those other factors, those other issues, those other desires crowding our hearts, crowding our principles, crowding our outlook, choke the very word of God so that it becomes unfruitful now I don't know if anybody knows and Peter Gallagher I'm thinking of you if you're watching but I want to ask you the question in your mind what's the definition of a weed because everyone else talks about weeds and I once did a little bit of gardening um, for, a, for a summer I wasn't very good at it uh, that's why I'm no longer a gardener. Peter Gallagher is a gardener, so I'm expecting him to know this. So, Peter, if you're able to type it in or get somebody to type it in for you, please do. Um, but the definition of a weed, what is it? Has anybody got any ideas? To, yeah, yeah. Go on. Uh. 
Okay, yeah, that's one, that's one good, good definition. I'll work backwards, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you next, but go on, Dave. Okay. Very good, Dave. Alan, anything you're going to add to that? No, no. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the idea, Margaret, were you going to give one there? Yeah, yeah, but similar idea, yeah. Absolutely. Actually, there is no biological definition of a weed. There's not some things are weeds and some things are, are plants. A weed is literally just a plant that's in a place that it shouldn't be. It's the plant that shouldn't be there. That's the picture that we have here. The Bible tells us that only God should be in the place where he's the source of our worship. He's the object of our worship. He's our focus. He's our, our, our reason uh, and our guide for life. And in some ways, that's what this plant, this seed is, is going to be. But in this picture, what we have is other things are in the place where the seed of faith in God should be, crowding it. So that's very much what we're seeing. The sower wants to scatter this particular seed, the word of God, but it's being choked and crowded out by other things that shouldn't be there. And the Bible writers regularly remind us to remove from our lives anything that holds us back from our worship, our relationship with God. So, for example, in Hebrews chapter 12, we're exhorted to, well, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And we can think about uh, the things that perhaps entangle us, the sin that holds us back in our relationship, the things that individually affect us as we listen to our next hymn, which reflects on the fact that we have Jesus as a friend, and that's an incredible statement that we shouldn't take lightly. We have Jesus as a friend to help us with that, and we should be regularly going to him in prayer to help remove these things. Well, there's a reminder of the importance of, of prayer and the help that is available to us if we're genuinely wanting to detangle and weed our lives, which we should be. So the next slide uh, shows the good soil. For those who are listening, it shows lovely brown, rich soil, very deep, a little thin layer of uh, beautiful green lush grass on top. Uh, and that gives us a picture of the good soil that Jesus talks about. So this soil is, again, receptive to the seed. 
And Jesus describes it as treasuring the seed, as holding fast to the seed. And it, it cultivates it consistently. It talks about having a good heart and an honest heart. And it's fruitful. It talks about being a, the, the seed producing a hundred times, 60 times, 30 times. And that begs the question, doesn't it? If, if as we, most of us here, I think, would hope, our hearts are good soil, how fruitful are we? Personally, I'm glad he stopped at 30 in the parable because I'm a little bit worried how low he'd have to go to reach me. And I'm a little bit concerned that he might have to break into decimal places uh, to get me. But that's, that's something to, to think about because fruitfulness is really important in the Bible. Not, let me stress this, not as a way to earn salvation. So if you get to a certain level of productivity, of Christian fruitfulness, then you've got salvation. Not that at all. Because as you see, the seed comes first, is received, and the fruitfulness comes afterwards. The fruitfulness is a sign of the reality and the vitality of our faith. So if we're not seeing the fruit of our Christian faith coming out in our life, in our character, in our personality, our choices, our interactions with people, uh, then that's a warning sign to us that we need to look at the soil of our heart. Fruitfulness is something that Jesus went to regularly. So it's, if it's important for him, it should be important for us. We see that in Matthew chapter 3, chapter 7, chapter 12, chapter 21. Jesus repeatedly emphasising the importance of our Christian life, our Christian faith being fruitful. He taught in John chapter 15 about the parable of the true vine and talked about the unfruitful branches being cut off. And the writer James in chapter 2 puts it this way, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, so another way of saying this fruit coming out, it's dead. In verse 16 of that passage from John 15, it says that Jesus has chosen us, those who believe and follow him, and appointed us so that we might go and bear fruit. That's what we're being appointed for. That's what the good soil should be producing. It's what we're meant to be. That's the plant we're meant to be growing. So we've looked at the soil. Let's just, for a moment, be clear about what we're talking about when we talk about the seed. When we're talking about the seed, which Jesus describes as the word of God, and that taking root... We're not talking about knowing passages of the Bible. We're not talking about reading and being able to recite parts of the Bible or knowing the Bible stories and the points that come out of them. Beneficial and helpful though those are, that's not what it's talking about. Mark makes this clear in his version of this by talking about accepting it. You see, the the message throughout the Word of God, throughout the Bible throughout God's revelation, is first of all for the need of a saviour, then it's the promise of the saviour, and then it's the provision of the saviour. That's what the message of the Bible, that's what the word of God is consistently ascribing. If you take the Bible and cut it like a bar of rock, you see that running through every part of it. Jesus runs through every part of the Bible, whether he's mentioned by name or not. So what this is talking about is accepting the message of the Bible, accepting and trusting, relying on that part of the Bible. Interestingly, Jesus described himself as the living word. Sorry, he was, he was described as the living word at the beginning of John's gospel. In verse 14, this is what John says. The word became flesh and made his dwelling upon us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So Jesus himself is the word of God. So we could look at the seed being the word of God as the seed being Jesus. And that would fit, I don't want to overstretch the seed analogy, but that would fit with another seed metaphor that Jesus used in John chapter 12, where he likened his, his forthcoming death to a seed falling to the earth. This is what he, he said. J- 
Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed, a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So Jesus describes himself as a seed that must die to produce that crop. And that's true of that picture of our faith being produced and being worthwhile and that relationship that grows out of it. Because without the seed, without Jesus' act on the cross, our faith would be pointless. Unless Jesus had done it, our faith in it, it's like saying, I really believe there's a, there's a, there's a seed, a plant going to grow up. If the seed doesn't go in, it doesn't matter how much you believe it. So without the seed, nothing. And in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, we have the consequence, the effect of that faith in that seed described for us, that seed that is Jesus dying for us. It says this in 1 Peter 1. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So you were very good earlier at describing the sorts of things you needed to do for care, for the seeds, the plants, uh, in your physical gardens <coughs> or, or plant pots at home. What do we need to do for faithful seed care, for the care of the seed of faith? Well, we need to remember that the seed is a gift which has to be received. So if you haven't received it, can I encourage you to do so? Soften your heart. Ask God to, to, to remove the hardness. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even the faith that we have is a gift from God, and we should ask God for it. Just as Jesus described that, um, that soil holding the seed fast, treasuring it, we should treasure it. We should value and protect and guard are that seed, that seedling, that small plant of faith. However long we've been a Christian, don't just leave it and think it'll do okay on its own. <clears throat> the soil of our lives, the soil of our heart, needs to be consistently cultivated. It doesn't matter how well you prepare a garden, if you then leave it for four years and come back, it'll be a mess. However long we've been a Christian, we need to keep gardening the soil of our hearts we are the ones who determine what the soil of our heart is like we decide whether we're going to have a hard heart a shallow heart a crowded heart or a receptive heart and that's what james was trying to encourage believers to do to keep looking after the soil of their heart he put it this way therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you the, work, the word of God will not achieve its purpose in our lives unless we continually develop and maintain receptive hearts. We listen to a very old song and it's, it's meaningless in itself. But it, but it asks the question, if I should plant one tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, would you care for it and tend it every day? And in many ways, that's the question that God asks us. He has planted that tiny seed. For all of us who, who claim to be Christians who profess that, that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves. Are we nurturing and protecting our faith? It's a daily responsibility. The second letter to the Corinthian church reminds us that we live by faith, not by sight. If that's the case, we need to look after that plant of faith so reflect on the importance that you place on faith and nurturing um, that small plant that seedling whatever age you are however long you've been a christian what you're doing to, to to nurture and care for that little plant of faith in your life in your heart while we listen to uh, the song oceans which reflects on an, a, an event that's recorded in the very next chapter of matthew's gospel where peter 
steps out of the boat onto the water in faith because Jesus asked him to. I have to be honest, I wouldn't do that. I wish I would, but I wouldn't. But you reflect on it, on what you do to look after that as we listen to Oceans. in prayer and I'm going to borrow the uh, prayer for the Ephesian church Father God I pray that out of your glorious riches you may strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and I pray that we being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide 
and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our service is at an end and we'll say goodbye to those who are watching on YouTube uh, and uh, listening uh, via Zoom.